Well, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon uh, for another one of our uh, historical talks. Uh, I'm Troy with the Brunswick Historical Society. Uh, a couple things that I'd like to mention is I'd like to thank uh, the library for partner, partnering with us and uh, providing the space for us. And I also like to acknowledge that this is the traditional territory of the Wostokway Wos people. Every month we try to bring a little bit uh, more about uh, New Brunswick history, and today's no different. So uh, I'll turn it over here to uh, Mr. Power. I'll get out of the way. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Steve Fowler. Uh, you know, since you showed up, you probably saw some of the uh, promotional material for this, but I will uh, give you a little bit of an outline. I have spent the past 30 odd years as a military reenactor in my spare time. We portray uh, a Revolutionary War unit called the Lancey's Brigade. And I've actually, and I, I do thank the Historical Society for inviting me back. I spoke here a few years ago. For those of you who are faithful, they, uh, some may sound a little familiar, but I think we're going to cover some new territory today. On that occasion, what I spoke about was doing historical research as a reenactor. The information that we're typically after is a little bit different than what uh, your average history book gives you. So I talked about that and where we found that kind of information. Today I'm going to talk about the brigade itself. And uh, so this is the historical brigade that was formed in New York to fight with the British on the side of the, uh, the king in the American Revolution. Um, I will preface this by saying that uh, you start out, and I started talking with Greg about this about a year and a half ago, and schedules conflicted, and I was busy and didn't get here. And, but a year and a half ago, I started sort of idly collecting information to talk about today. And your mindset when you're doing that is, where in places am I going to find enough detail about this to be able to occupy 45 minutes? And so you putter away at it over a year and a half, and finally you get around to showing up here. And a week ago, you look at all the little bits and pieces and things you've tidied up and realized, where in hell am I going to find time in 45 minutes to talk about all of this? So I'm going to kind of do an overview, but I'm certainly happy to try and answer any questions you have. If there's anything that I leave out, if I know it, I'll be happy to answer questions about it afterward. I will also say that unlike some of my August, compa August companions who occupy this space with PhDs and things of that nature, I'm not a professional historian. I have... Uh, my academic credentials are a business degree, which helps not at all with this sort of thing. Where I come from is someone who has a significant amount of passion for the history of, of this period. It's the history of my family, the history of our city, and, uh, and obviously an interest that has come uh, been born of, of actually portraying these people over the last 30 years. So I will have that perspective, and I will not pretend to be an historian or to be in any way all-knowing. The things that I'm telling you, I'm simply sharing what I've learned, and what I'm learning as I go along, and after 30 years, I'm still learning. Um, so bear with me, and, uh, but I'm, I'm entirely open to your criticisms if you think you know better, because inevitably the one thing you discover as a reenactor, and I'm guessing as an historian, is the minute you figure you figure something out, Somebody comes along and proves you wrong. So that's, you know, um, and that's not a good feeling when you spend $1,000 on a uniform and then you find out that it's not for pay, but that's okay. <laughs> anyway, so getting down to it, we're here to talk about the Lancet <coughs> Brigade. So what I've had up there is actually the orders on the 29th of September, 1776, uh, when Commander in Chief of the British Forces, William Howe, appointed the officers who would lead, form, and lead the Lancet Brigade. So, okay, now it's working. There we go. Now it's just what program it's in. So I'm sorry, my presentation's there, my notes are here, so I'm going to be lost without these. So. I'm going to start, and I, I titled this The Lancet Brigade and the Provincial Forces for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, talking about the Provincial Forces in general, and I will describe to you what the Provincial Forces are, is necessary to provide a little context for who the Lancet is and why they existed and what they did. Um, the other reason is that unlike perhaps some of the, well, even their 
fellow soldiers, the British units that they fought side by side with, uh, regiments that existed long before they came to the American colonies to uh, try to put down a rebellion, and still exist today, they have long and distinguished histories, and they've been looking after them and preserving them. The history of provincial units is 248-year-old information um, about a group of military entities that were by and large created in 1776 or after, and were history, literally, by 1783. Um, so the evidence that we have of their existence is actually not insignificant. It's surprisingly good when you start getting <coughs> into it. But some of what we know about them, we know about them collectively because when it's that little bit of information from that long ago, you have to sort of meld things together. Um, that said, obviously I will try to pick out what I can specifically about the Lanceys, but that may be where there's some holes as well. So, the Provincial Corps. The Provincial Corps was born out of what was essentially a British practice at the time. In the 18th century, most of us will know that the British were a mighty sea power. They were also a, a power on land. They did have a, a, a relatively powerful military, but relative to their navy, it was not uh, as big a group. And they were in the practice, because they were running all over the world. Of course, at that time, the British Empire was a vast, vast, vast holding. And so British troops were regularly sent all around the world to deal with these situations. And when they were dealing with colonial situations like this, it had become their practice to draw on local help. They would recruit local armies to support them in what they were doing, and they were no different here. Um, in fact, there was precedence for this because the 20, 25 years before, they had actually done pretty much the same thing when they were here um, fighting the French and Indian War, or what was known as the Seven Years' War in Europe, when they were actually taking command of this part of the world, North America. Um, and in fact, uh, Oliver Delancey, who would found and, and, uh, and command Delancey's brigade, um, was a, an officer, a militia officer, fighting with the British in the French and Indian War, as was a gentleman by the name of Washington, which tells us a lot about how, 20, 25 years later, at the evolution of the American Revolution, or the beginning of the American Revolution, how there was in fact the military leadership and expertise to raise armies on both sides from among the colonists. These were all British, for the most part, British trained officers who had fought in the Revolutionary or in the French and Indian War. Um, the key officers, key commanders, in many cases on both sides, were, uh, were former, uh, formerly affiliated with the British military. So this was the practice of the British to do this. Now, the Provincial Corps that I'm talking about does not encompass all combatants, does not encompass all loyalists who took up arms on behalf of the British in the Revolution. There were militia units, there were a group of people called associators, and I still haven't quite wrapped my head around those, there were a dozen or so units, um, and some of them were actually called associators. Um, there were local volunteer uh, military units. The difference between um, yeah, the difference between provincials and the others were, first of all, these are all by and large American colonists, but the provincials were full-time soldiers, okay? The, a lot of the significant things come down to who raised you, who paid you, if you got paid, and who more or less controlled you, and also the term that you were there to serve. So they were regular soldiers. They were in for the duration. They were equipped and paid by the Crown. They were uniformed soldiers. They were eligible for duty anywhere, although in Delancey's case, that's, there's some interesting things I'll reveal a little later on. Um, as opposed to, for instance, a militia, who would be typically, I think, raised locally, um, would most likely not be paid, not be uniformed, and militias were really raised to defend the home front. So you were called together, you were trained, um, and in some cases you were called out when the need arose. So 
on the other side, the Minutemen that most of us have heard about from Lexington and Concord, they were essentially militiamen. They were called from their homes. They were farmers who were called out to grab their muskets and come and do this sort of thing. The, the uh, provincial corps were actually soldiers, so apart from them. Um, in terms of numbers, the I've seen a number of people compile lists of there are records, obviously, of, of uh, the various provincial corps that existed, and some of them existed for the duration of the war, and some of them existed for actually a very small amount of time for a variety of reasons. Often they were swallowed by other groups, and in some cases, at least, this was because they couldn't raise a full complement of men, so they were swept up into something else. Um, there were regiments that were reduced. So the Lanceys, for instance, started uh, the war with three battalions, and by the end, we had two. Um, the New Jersey Volunteers, which was probably the largest, had six battalions, and I think they were down to three or four by the end of the war. So the numbers changed in terms of who was in there and participating. But um, the most comprehensive list easily that I found has been generated by a gentleman by the name of Todd Brayston. And uh, those of you who study the period may be familiar with Todd's name. Uh, I've known him for 30 years as a fellow reenactor, but he is also probably the preeminent researcher and writer on loyalist military history. Um, he knows more than the rest of us put together will, or he has forgotten more than the rest of us put together will ever know in, in, in that particular field. Todd has assembled a list which shows in excess of 70 provincial units. Um, additionally, about 45 uh, militia units and then another couple of dozen of the other types. So there were all kinds of military, quasi-military groups that were involved in supporting the British in this cause. Those 70 units were actually up to as many as 90 regiments, and that's significant because a regiment is generally a preset size. So if we talk about the commissioning of, of uh, the Lancey's officers, they were commissioned and instructed, permitted, encouraged to raise three battalions, of 500 men each. So, 90 battalions of provincial regiments gives you an idea about how many people they were hoping to raise. I don't know that, there were very few of them I think that ever reached their full complement. I've heard it debated as to whether or not Delancey's did. Um, I've read sources here just in the last few days that suggest that Delancey's, over the course of the war, um, might have comprised as many as 2,400 people, but they would have come and gone, and there were, of course, casualties, and there were all kinds of desertions on all sides of this particular war. People got sick, people were wounded. Um, whether or not that figure is accurate, I don't know, and I don't know for certain that they ever actually had three full 500-man battalions, but one expects that they got pretty close. Um, the other thing that was interesting about uh, the provincials were that they theoretically were all volunteers. But I did come across a letter written on September the 5th, 1776. It's Delancey writing to Colonel Fanning. And I'll just refer you to this part. I do hereby, for the encouragement of enlisting men in the county of Suffolk, give notice that upon any persons of good recommended characters raising a company of 70 men, they shall have commissions for one captain, one lieutenant, one ensign, and shall be paid and subsisted as the officers and soldiers are in British pay. And it is hoped that the inhabitants of the county will cheerfully raise the men wanted for this service, as it will prevent the disagreeable business of detaching them, which I shall be under the necessity of doing if the companies cannot be raised without it. Given under my hand the date above, Oliver Delancey, Brigadier General. I'm not sure that General Delancey got the memo about everybody being volunteers. Because, well, I've actually looked into how that word is used. I wasn't able to find anything specific to detaching them. But it sounds a whole lot to me like he planned to get his soldiers one way or the other. So there was uh, an aspect of this that may have been somewhat mandatory. Um, just returning for a moment to the, the numbers. Again, there are different estimates out there but I have read numbers that range from potentially 20,000 American columns fought with the British, which to me seems a little low in light of the number of regiments and units that were raised, up to as many as 50,000. 
and keeping in mind that there were also Americans who served as privateers for the king, and there were Americans who served in the Royal Navy, American colonists. So there were a pile of these people out there. So moving on to Delanceys themselves, now that we've got a little perspective on the, the provincials in general, Oliver Delancey was, bear with me, I hope that this is going to be a little smoother operation. There we go. So Oliver Delancey was from a prominent New York family. His father, uh, born Etienne, was a French Huguenot. Um, anglicized himself to Stephen Delancey when he ended up in New York some years later. Um, uh, came, I think, with uh, reasonable means uh, when he left France. Um, established himself as a very successful merchant um, in uh, New York. He obviously rose in prominence in the colony and the evidence of that actually can be seen in the fact that, excuse me, he um, he married a Van Cortland, a prominent family in New York, and his children all married into powerful families or became powerful in their own right. His eldest son, James, became, I think, the Chief Justice of New York. Oliver was uh, the senior um, loyalist uh, general in the, uh, on the British side. The, um, his daughters married again into prominent families. Virtually all of the male side of the family seemed to end up one way or another in politics, so they were obviously a very well-connected family. He was the guy that was called upon, theoretically volunteered, to raise Loyalist battalions. He was in common company, and of course he also, as I said, had some French and Indian War experience, but he was a man of means. Now, keeping in mind that Oliver was born in uh, 1781, so, or, I'm sorry, Oliver was born in the early 1700s. He was a man in his late 50s by the time the war broke out. So he probably wasn't running into the field with sword in hand to fight this battle. But interestingly, other key units, the uh, New Jersey Volunteers were uh, commanded, formed and commanded by Corporal Skinner, who was the former Attorney General of New Jersey. Um, the King's Royal Regiment of New York, the Royal Yorkers, uh, were formed by Sir John Johnson. He came from a prominent family. His father was uh, with the Indian Department, a, a prominent uh, administrator. Um, Colonel Edmund Fanning, who uh, raised the King's American Regiment, uh, was the son-in-law of the governor of North uh, Carolina and a, a staff member of his. So these were prominent people that were given the charge of doing this. I've heard it discussed that these people were all people of wealth, and that they may well have invested some of their wealth in raising these units. Interestingly, in doing some research, I've never seen any specific written reference to that, so I don't know how much that came into play. They were provincial troops. They were commissioned through, uh, you know, the, the British Army. So they were provided for, um, but I, I wouldn't suggest that the, the wealth of these people wasn't somehow invested in, in at least getting them off the ground but I, I simply can't find any evidence one way or the other. Um, so going back to that though, there is one thing that I think is worth noting is that, okay, well it's the 18th century and the fact that rich white guys got given all of the power and authority, not really surprising. 21st century, unfortunately, it still isn't all that surprising. But there I think is something else in the calculation. I think the British knew what they were doing. As I said, they had precedent for doing this. They did go into the colonies. They did look for people to raise military support. And I suspect it had to do with being someone that was of sufficient influence that you could actually raise 1,500 men and get them to put on a uniform and pick up a musket. Because that's what was most essential to the British was finding the people who could turn into soldiers. So I, I think that that's probably why you see these very prominent names that, uh, that led these things. Given that a lot of these people would not probably have field. Delancey spent, to the best of my knowledge, the entire war in New York. Um, the vagary of, of this was that the Brigadier General commanding the entire brigade of three 
regiments, three battalions, I'm sorry, was also the colonel because of the first battalion, because battalions are commanded by colonels. That seemed to be the way that the 18th century military worked. I'm not sure that we really have that same sort of thing going on now, but that was the oddity at the time. So a regiment was commanded by a colonel, followed by with a lieutenant colonel and a major, and then a series of captains. Um, in this instance, he was the colonel of the 1st Battalion, but he and, to the best of my knowledge, the other colonels that commanded the regiments, they weren't field soldiers. Their lieutenant colonels were the people that were actually driving the bus. They were the ones that took soldiers into the field and had tactical command. Um, we'll talk a little bit about them. So, moving on from Let's move on to actually raising the brigade. So the screen that I had up there very first was the order that was uh, recorded on September the 29th, 1776. It was uh, basically commissioning the officers, uh, the senior officers down to the level of major, and it was authorizing them to raise three battalions for the defense of the king and his property and 500 men each. Um, that being the compliment. Um, so they went forth and, as you saw the letter, encouraged the citizenry to, uh, to join up. And they did. There were tens of thousands of, of loyalists who, uh, who joined the provincial forces and other forms of military service. Um, the Delanceys were initially uniformed um, in a green uniform. So I'm trying to leave reenacting as much out of this, but it's incredibly hard to find pictures of actual 18th century soldiers. Um, we're going to go with a uh, reenactor photo. This is the uniform, obviously, that our unit wears. This is the end of the war. So over the course of the war, at the beginning, the Lanceys and a lot of the provincial regiments would have been wearing green cloth. Whoa. They would have worn green coats. The Lanceys were green with white facings. About two years in, they were granted new uniforms. Um, stores would have come from England, most likely. And the uniform changed to red regimental coat, like this one, but with green facings. And then in 1783, just about in time to leave, they were issued new uniforms once again, and they were the red uniforms with the uh, royal blue facings. So soldier's uniform consisted of a regimental coat, um, white wool uh, waistcoat and knee breeches, woolen socks, leather buckle shoes, and a cocked hat. Some people refer to it as a tricorn, I call it a bicorn because it actually only opens on the sides, it's just peaked at the front. So it's actually only got two open corners. Um, they were armed with 75 caliber brown best musket and they carried a cartridge box, which is what you're seeing here, and on his other hip he's got a bayonet and those are suspended by the white belt, so that's why you see the famed British cross belts. And that was basically the uniform. That was also the uniform summer and winter. Now there were variations. There are records of them wearing linen trousers, which instead of knee breeches would have gone all the way to the ankle. Um, and some other variations. They were uh, certainly soldiers in the 18th century. I can't speak specifically to the Lanceys. Were also issued certain winter wear. They were issued blanket coats, among other things. Um, which is literally a, uh, some people call them a capote, but it's a blanket, it, it's a coat that is cut out of a blanket. There's a very specific pattern where you take a blanket and you cut it in particular shapes and sew it all back together and it's a coat. I have one, it works really well, it's very warm. Um, particularly for a hobby that we primarily pursue in June, July, August, and September. Um, but, uh, but it's neat to have. The, fundamentally though, this was the uniform they wore. Now, interestingly, um, you'll notice that his skirts are pinned back, so the, the dropped portion of the coat, which comes almost to the knee, is actually pinned back with an eye and hook, but that was a hook and eye, it could be released so the coat could be dropped. These are not just decorative, those are working lapels. So they can be unbuttoned and buttoned over. So you can actually have some warmth out of a, this coat in the wintertime. Um, when need be. Um, 
It is all wool. It's lined somewhat with linen. Oh, and the other piece of the uniform you're not seeing in this shot is he is wearing a white linen shirt. So wool and linen were the common fabrics back then. Cotton was a very, very, somewhat the opposite to today. Um, everybody had linen, and if you were wealthy and well-to-do, cotton was now is a little more available than we once thought it was, but cotton was certainly not as common or anywhere near as common as linen was at that time. Um, and uh, I wish we could actually get back to that because I will tell you with authority that there is nothing in here more comfortable to wear than a linen shirt. Um, worth that I could afford them in this century. Uh, so that fundamentally is the entire uniform and uh, a soldier might have also carried a haversack um, which would have been fundamentally for storing lunch in. If you're scavenging in the countryside that's where the chicken lives. Um, <coughs> Uh, they did not have a great deal else, and uh, given that this gentleman is going to, uh, when he hits the road with his regiment, he's going to live in a tent, a tent that is approximately six feet high. It's what we would describe as a pup tent, but a little bit bigger. It's six feet across, it's about seven feet deep, and he and four of his closest friends are going to occupy that jointly. So, they didn't have a whole lot of room for luggage anyway. Um, so, moving on to sort of their initial role and where they're occupied and, and what they did. Um, initially, they were raised, again, and it was in the initial orders, raised primarily for the defense. And I didn't read it, but I, I, that piece that I did read to you at the top of it, it said, raised to defend this island. So they were raised, the unit was raised entirely on Long Island, um, or 90% anyway. It was raised for the defense of Long Island, um, conveniently overlooking the fact that any provincial regiment can be sent anywhere the king wants it to go. But there was a little piece, have you ever had a job description that the bottom said, and other tasks may be required? They had one too. It was worded, and other exigencies. So, two years later, two-thirds of Delancey's brigade found themselves in Georgia. We'll come to that in a minute. Um, they weren't advertising that when they were recruiting, but the fact was that uh, they, they could and then they were uh, sent away when the need arose. But they started out, um, they were posted, the three regiments were posted to Oyster Bay, Huntington, and Brookhaven. I think I've got a map here. I did this actually as much for me as for you, because it gives you a better picture those places are all up along this area. So they're on the north shore of Long Island. So again, if you're not familiar, Manhattan is right here. Long Island is 100 times the size and runs out into the Atlantic. And the reason they were here is because the rebels were here. So there, what they were there for was, well, they were there to defend the island, but what they were defending from primarily were raids from coming across Long Island Sound from Connecticut. And one of their more noteworthy engagements was, uh, was just exactly that, and I'll tell you about that in a few minutes. So what you're seeing here is uh, Oyster Bay was down in here somewhere. That was actually headquarters for a while. Some of the orders were issued from there by uh, Delancey's orders were coming from there. Um, the regiments were ranged out here. They were moved around a bit. They eventually pulled back from some of these posts. Um, at one point, uh, this is all early war, the first and second were set up into uh, well, what's now the Bronx, up in the northern portion of, uh, of uh, what, Manhattan Island. Um, and by the end of the war, they were most, for the most part, pulled back to uh, western uh, Long Island and were simply sitting there, keeping anyone from coming in, given that by the end of the war, loyalists were teaming into Long Island and into New York, because it was pretty much the only real estate still belonged to the British. <coughs> Um, and Delancey's obviously was playing a fairly key role then as well because they were securing that area for the Loyalists. So, beyond defending Long Island, another key task that they were involved with was, for, involved with was foraging. 